proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling, falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming that whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. <clears throat> I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. Dear friends in Christ, <clears throat> there's an old proverb that says, forewarned is forearmed. The idea is that if you forewarn someone of something that's to come, you forearmed them with the knowledge to address that situation. You've given them a tactical advantage to respond. This proverb is reflected in Longfellow's famous poem, Paul Revere's Ride. You're probably familiar with it. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. This poem embellishes upon the historical account of Paul Revere and several companions who rode through the towns north of Boston, warning the colonists there that the British were advancing and creating a network of messengers who were able to effectively spread that message that the British were headed north from Boston to Concord. Now they say that this, this network of messengers was so effective that some towns 25 miles north of Boston had heard about the coming invasion before the British had even docked their ships in the harbor. And the result of it was that when the British finally reached Concord, that the colonists were there waiting for them and able to drive them back to Boston without the loss of any lives of the townspeople there. And so, forewarned is forearmed. Paul Revere and his friends forewarned the people of what was coming, and he forearmed them, giving them the advantage against the British troops. There's a different sort of advance that is taking place in our day and age. This is the advance of the world against Christians. Now, this advance has always taken place, and yet every day as we go on, it seems to be getting worse and worse. But Jesus not only forewarns us of the advance to come, of the persecution that we can expect, but he also actively forearms us. This reminds me of Psalm 118, where we can confidently say with the psalmist, the Lord is on my side. What can man do to me? Because Jesus forewarns us of what is to come, and he also forearms us with the spirit of truth. May the Lord bless our study this morning. We begin with verse 1 of our text. And in my, in my manuscript, I have it printed in a different version, so it'll just sound a little different than your bulletin. But anyways, verse 1 of our text. These things I have spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. When Jesus says, he's talking about these things, he's pointing to a couple of statements he had already made before in chapter 15, particularly verses 18 and 20, where he says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. And if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. So he's saying, the world will hate you, and the world will persecute you. And then he further describes that persecution in verse 2 of our text. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God's service. So Jesus forewarns us of all the persecution that we may endure because it's the type of persecution that may cause us to stumble, that may cause us to fall away from our faith. And so he wants to forewarn us about these things. Now throughout history, Christians have been persecuted by all sorts of different groups. Think about the Apostle Paul. How he would persecute, he would lead the charge in hunting down Christians. And in so doing, he thought that he was doing God a favor. He thought that he was giving God service in killing Christians. Think about the early Christian church during the time of the Roman Empire. The Romans saw Christianity as a nuisance, as a pest that needed to be stomped out. And so they hunted down and tried to eradicate Christianity. I think of our modern day example of the uh, radical Islamist group ISIS. Frequently we hear about their work in 
ex executing Christians merely for the faith that they profess. Should we be surprised when all of this all of this evil, all of this persecution comes to the doorstep of God's people, Christians. Well, no. As Jesus tells us in verse 4, For these things I have told you, that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. So what do we think when we see all this persecution happening to Christians? Well, I think that depends on two things. I think it depends on who, it's, who this persecution is happening to, and at what time in history this persecution is taking place. So think, for instance, about the early Christian church and the Romans' persecution. At, when we look at this time period, we often take a, a wide-angle look at what happened. See, the Romans tried to completely stomp out Christianity. They thought they could drive the people from their homes, kill them, threaten them, do anything to cause them to reject Christ, and if they didn't, they would kill them. And they thought they would rid the world of Christianity once and for all. And yet, as we look back, we take this wide-angle look, we see the exact opposite actually happened. As people were driven from their homes, as they were driven from their towns, they went throughout the Mediterranean region with the word, spreading the word to all those that they came in contact with. And those people who were being martyred, they served as sources of inspiration and hope for those who are being persecuted for their faith. So as we look back at this time period, it's easy to see that even though Christians are facing persecution, that God was in control the entire time. That his mighty right hand was directing the events of history so for the good of the church. So then what happens when this persecution hits a lot closer to our homes, when it lands on our doorsteps? I think then we take a lot narrower, uh, we have a lot narrower look at what's happening. When we face persecution, when we're being mocked for our faith either in the media or by people that we run into from up close or from afar, what is our reaction? I think it could be and does tend to be one of any number of things. Sometimes when we're being mocked for our faith, when God is being put down in some way, we often just sit there quietly, almost ashamed of the fact that we're Christians. Sometimes when we see all this persecution, we start to wonder if it's even worth it to be a Christian, if the world is right the entire time. Maybe, and I think a lot of us can relate to this, maybe when you're being persecuted, you immediately wish evil upon the person who's, who's harming you, almost wishing that, they should just go to hell for what they have done to you. Maybe in pride, you start to wish that people wouldn't ask or people wouldn't find out that you're a Christian. You hide your light under a bushel basket, so to speak. Now, at times when we face a trial for our faith, when we have to bear our crosses, it seems like we would rather drop that cross and run far away from any trouble that we face. And in addition to these reactions, do we sometimes doubt that God is really in control when we see such persecution? Isn't it hard to believe that there is an all-powerful God out there who lets his children suffer? I think that can be a huge temptation for a lot of Christians who start to question, is there really a God? Can there be a God when his own people suffer for their faith? But again, what does Jesus say? He says, these things I have told you, that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. Jesus forewarned us long ago of all the persecution that we can expect. And we don't have any reason to fear. Jesus tells us in Matthew 10, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. That is the simple and encouraging truth behind all of the world's persecution. People may seek to harm you. A Christian may even die for his faith. But no one can kill your soul. You see, Jesus bought your soul for a costly price. He laid down his life so that you could live. He planted faith in your heart so that you would believe in that word, you would believe in that message, and that you could be saved. He has granted you 
eternal life. And you are precious in his sight so that now he won't let anyone take that faith away from you. When John 10, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Jesus is talking about each one of you in these verses. The world may war against you, but you are in the hands of the Almighty God. No mockers, no persecutors, not even the devil himself is able to take you out of the loving hands of your Savior, Jesus Christ. The world hates you, but it's only because it hated Jesus first. And why does it hate Jesus? It's because he won. He won the victory over the world. As he says in John 16, 33, In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. We are on the side of the victor, Jesus Christ, who has overcome the world for our sakes so that now we can confidently say, The Lord is on my side. What can man do to me? Not only did Jesus forewarn us of all these different things that we can expect, but he also actively forearms us with the spirit of truth. We read about that in verse 26, the first verse of our text. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. So Jesus is talking here about the Holy Spirit. And he calls him the spirit of truth, the Helper. And the Greek word used here for a helper is parakletes. Uh, that's related to the, the word in, the first, in our first hymn today, in second verse. It said, um, called the Holy Spirit the paraclete. And you may have been wondering what that meant. Well, what that means, what parakletes means, literally in Greek, is called alongside of. So you get the picture of someone who's called to stand alongside of someone else who needs his help. And that's where we get the idea of a helper, or a comforter, or an advocate. And that's how the Spirit is being described in our text. Now you can only imagine how the disciples must have felt on this particular evening when Jesus is um, addressing them. See, for the past couple of chapters, Jesus has been trying to prepare them for life without him. Because soon he would be taken away, arrested, crucified, Soon after, he would ascend into heaven and no longer physically be present with the disciples. So you can only imagine, they must have felt just this extreme level of despair, a level of hopelessness. Their God, their master who had been with them this entire time, was about to leave them alone. And so Jesus assures them he wouldn't be leaving them alone. Rather, he would send them God the Holy Spirit, who would stand alongside of them in their battle with the hating world. Now in the first verse, we get a glimpse of the Trinity in action. I'm going to read it, but notice, try and take note of the change in verb tense. Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit, and he talks about him both in the future tense and in the present tense. So describing the Spirit, he says, Whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. So you notice the change in tense there? Speaking about the Spirit in the future, Jesus says, I will send you the Spirit. And he's referring there to Pentecost. When he would send the Spirit to the disciples, they would be filled with the Spirit and they'd proclaim in many different tongues the saving message of salvation to people of all sorts of different nationalities. And then he also speaks about them in the present tense, saying that the Holy Spirit is already proceeding from God the Father. So this is describing what we call the eternal procession of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so what's that? What is the eternal procession and why is that important to us? Well, the eternal procession, in the eternal procession, God has always been sending the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has continually proceeded from God from way back in eternity all the way until today in 2016. And so why does that matter to us? Why should that be an encouragement for us? Well, in the Holy Spirit's eternal procession from God, he has constantly been sent 
to be alongside of us. So that today in 2016, we know that the Holy Spirit is standing alongside of us in our battle with the hating world, just as he stood alongside the disciples some 2,000 years ago. Amidst all the persecution that we can expect and that Jesus warned about in our lives, we know that we have God at our sides. And that is truly encouraging. And so what are some of the benefits of having the Holy Spirit, having God at our side? Well, we already talked about the persecution at length that we can expect and the different temptations that come up with that, how it could cause some of us to stumble and fall away. Well, when we're being tempted in this way, the Holy Spirit is at our side leading us to the Word where we have a way of escape from, them, from temptation. And if we fall into sin, like often seems to happen the second that we're tempted, the Holy Spirit is still standing there alongside of us as our helper, pointing us back to the Word, reassuring us that we have been forgiven even for that sin. He has planted faith in our hearts so that we can grab hold confidently of that gospel message and be assured and know that Christ has paid for each one of our sins, that we are forgiven, that Christ was victorious, and because of that, each one of you are victorious as well. Those are a couple huge benefits of having God and the Holy Spirit at our side. Another benefit is described in verse 27. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. So here Jesus is giving the disciples the directive to go out and preach the word to the entire world. And they would spread out. They would spread out around the Mediterranean and share the word with not only Jews, but also Gentiles. And the entire way, the Holy Spirit would be alongside of them as their helper, as their comforter. Now, in your mission to spread the word to the world. You also have the Holy Spirit alongside of you. Now it can be intimidating to do so, especially as we're going out to a world that we know hates us, that we kind of assume won't believe the word even if we share it with them. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. In verse 26 we read, The Spirit of truth, he will testify of me. The Holy Spirit is the one giving the testimony through the scriptures. He's merely using you as a mouthpiece. The Holy Spirit is able to create faith in the hearts of anyone, just as he created faith in your hearts. And as you go out as sheep amongst wolves, spreading the word, you know that God is alongside of you, able to create more sheep all the time. Jesus didn't leave his disciples alone, and he hasn't left you alone either. The Spirit is with you as your advocate, as your helper, always bringing you to the truth of his word. And though we know that we can face and we will face many troubles in our lives, we know that that deepest, darkest, worst, most impassable trouble in our lives, our sin, has already been overcome by our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, the rest of the world can do anything it wants to try and harm us, but it can never change this fact that we are redeemed child of God. We are redeemed children of God, and God has saved a place in heaven for each one of us. So now, in light of all of this, we can confidently say together the words of Psalm 118, The Lord is on my side. I need not fear. What can man do to me? Thank you, Lord, for granting us this confidence through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.